Welcome to the Not in the Job Description podcast. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. No matter what type of job you've had, there were situations that happened to you during work that you couldn't wait to tell your friends about. We interview a variety of guests about some of their crazy stories from work, from entry-level food service industry jobs to doctors and attorneys. We will explore funny, gross, embarrassing, scary, and sometimes almost unbelievable stories that people have experienced while on the job. Keep in mind that our guests or the companies they work for may be masked in order to protect the innocent, or maybe even the guilty. On today's show, we talked to our friend Jeff about being a firefighter. So, Jeff, I know that uh, we know a little bit about your early, early history because we all worked at a steakhouse together, and, and it was probably what made you think I really have to have a different job. <laughs> so, can you tell us a little bit about what even got you into wanting to be a firefighter or EMS? Growing up, my neighbor across the street was a firefighter for the city that we lived in. So occasionally I would see, he either worked at the station that was, you know, right around the corner. So they would come by the house and the fire truck and stuff. And I was like, oh. And then I can't remember exactly how old I was. I want to say I was like eight or nine. And the next door neighbor's house caught on fire and they were there. And I just thought, you know, that is the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> You mean the fact that you set that fire? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a chimney fire or something, if I okay. remember right. And so I remember as I got older and I was talking to him, there was an option when you were high school age that you could go to. We had like career centers. And I asked him, I said, is that is that a route to go? Because they have like a firefighter program in the career center. And he's like, oh, hell no, you don't want to do that. He's like, go find something you want to do. On your days off, he goes, because I work at Lazarus moving furniture on my days off and it sucks. And so find something that you want to do. And so I knew I liked, you know, doing landscaping and stuff like that or whatever. So I went to the career center for that. But it was funny. It was like I was pretty good at it doing like landscape design stuff or whatever. And I won like these it's not 4-H. What's the uh, FFA was like affiliated with the landscaping yeah. thing. And so we'd have to go to these competitions and do these designs and stuff or whatever. And I'd like win these things. And they're like, where do you want to, what do you want to do with this? And I'm like, ah, I just want to do this on my days off. Cause I'm going to be a fireman. <laughs> and they're like, what? And, um, and so that's just kind of how it went. And so I kind of knew right off when I, after I graduated, I went to fire school through the, the, uh, state fire Academy and then went to EMT school and everything. All right. So, I don't really have a frame of reference on what is fire school. What does that entail? Basically, it's like the nuts and bolts of it is it's like 240 hours of training, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's basically you go through, I mean, you're, you're learning, you know, operating a pump. They touch on some of the basic kind of rescue things and things like that. But a lot of it is ladders and ventilation and fire ground type scenario stuff. In truthfulness, I mean, when you show up your first day, it's like, you know, you have this teeny bit of knowledge and most of it just comes from experience. I mean, you, you have enough, you know enough. I mean, that's kind of the joke. It's like you might know enough, you know, to keep yourself from getting killed, but it really is over the over your time, the experience and everything that kind of builds on that. So, you know, one, I think one of the um, impressions of the of firemen in the firehouse is, you know, it's a great group of guys, the camaraderie. As the new guy, your first day on the job, I don't want to say hazing per se, but do they kind of make it rough on the new kids for a while oh, yeah. until they get kind of up and running? And it used to be way worse than it is now. I mean, I, I don't think we could have, you know, gotten away with the the stuff that um, that happened then nowadays or whatever. I think somebody might go to jail. But, yeah, it's interesting because it's like, you know, it was everything, I mean, from depending on – the shift you were on to where they'd say, oh, hey, um, come out back. We have to show you this or whatever. And they were like, dump a bucket of water on somebody. And, you know, it's all fun. And But I remember there was a guy, I mean, this this crew, it wasn't the crew I was on, but they did that same thing. Well, the, the apparatus floor was like concrete, very slippery when it got wet, which 
wasn't a great design. Um, so this guy dumped the bucket of water on. He takes off running, and slips, breaks his arm. Oh. So then the guys are like, oh, man. So they get the medic crew out there or whatever, and they're like, hey, he broke his arm. They get him on, you know, they're like, oh, we got to take him over to the hospital because it's obviously broken. Put him on the cot, and they're wheeling him out to the medic, and they dump water on him while he's on the cot again. <laughs> and I'm just like. I just think that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I see no problem with that. Well, I mean, when your motto to join the school is, we'll teach you enough to not kill yourself. I didn't see that in the recruiting material, but I'm, I'm only guessing that uh, you get a certain type of person involved there. Now, I can tell you, I, I work in or have worked in a lot of businesses and held a lot of jobs that to an external person, they just seem really cool, really sexy. And I think firefighting and, and doing police work and EMT stuff, I think it's kind of the same thing where I'm sure if I said, what was your day like? You know, when you start, you'd probably go, ah, it's just a normal thing. But you got to realize that a lot of the things you probably ran into, they're not the everyday kind of scenarios that normal you know, myself, Joe Blow walking down the street runs into. Do you remember the first time you saw something particularly heinous when you started working as a firefighter or EMT? I remember like one of the first fires that we had and it was like pretty, you know, kind of cut and dry. It was like a basement fire. We were down there and the, most houses you would go into, there's a ton of stuff in the basement. And so we're trying to get down there and, you know, we can see like the glow of the fire down there and we're trying to hit it with water or whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, whatever reason, I mean, it was kind of that aha moment of this is pretty dangerous. They, for whatever reason, had a 20 pound propane cylinder down there and it got hot enough that all of a sudden it blows off. Not, not like an explosion, right. but there's the release like a, valve. Yes. All of a sudden it's this gas fed fire. and It's like, what is going on? <laughs> You know, because you're just not expecting that in somebody's basement that there's a grill cylinder down there or whatever. And so it was a little surprising. It was like, oh, man. I like to start the story. You said, yeah, it was just your normal old fire. <laughs> to the people that lived in that house, they were probably like, oh, shit, well, my basement's on fire. <laughs> it is. And, and that's kind of, you know, it's always, I mean, 31 years now doing it. I, um, It's pretty cool. I mean, in all honesty, to be there to help somebody on what is their worst day, you know? Right, um, right. And, and whatever it happens to be, I mean, that's probably the worst thing these people have ever experienced and whatever you can do to be there and help is pretty awesome. I mean, and that that's aside from numerous people that, you know, you run on and they are in cardiac arrest and they come back, you know, a month later to the firehouse and thank you. And you're just like, wow, you know, and they got all their grandkids with them or whatever. And it's like, it's, it's pretty cool that you, uh, you know, had a, had a hand in that or whatever, when they come back and do that. Yeah. I, I'm uh, very empathetic and sympathetic when I see people in pain. So I don't know that I, it would be the best job for me. And I remember as a kid, my oldest sister was graduating high school. And so this had to be, probably, I mean, it was a long time ago and we were down at this you know big auditorium downtown and my dad was there and he worked for the school system as like security. So he was outside and I was kind of hanging with him and I hear this motorcycle rev up and this guy ends up hitting like the curb and his motorcycle goes flying. And that was the first time I ever got to see a compound fracture of a femur. And I thought to myself, you know, my dad, who uh, he, he had no feelings in his body, like nothing would get this guy. He could have seen this guy catch on fire and he would have been just fine. This guy's on the ground screaming. I look down at him and I can see bone coming out of his jeans. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be sick. And my dad just went over and started talking to him. But when the EMS, the paramedics got there, I remember thinking, that's exactly who I want to be taking care of this stuff. Cause to them, it was just another day at work and they got somebody to take care of. And I think a lot of these types of jobs like this, you probably have more stories than you know. Oh <laughs> but, yeah. But to us, it's very different to you. It's very mundane everyday story. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I think there's a lot of times, you know, some people have some PTSD and stuff from it. And there's times where you're like, man, I wish my brain could forget everything that my eyes have seen. But it, it's just part of it, and you know that. And I mean, it's it's funny because you sign up for this job that seems totally awesome, and then you know, years into it, you're like, oh well, the sleep deprivation. When you're woken up 
three or four times a night in REM sleep or whatever, it's the worst possible thing on your body. And, you know, combined with the toxins that are in fires and, and then come to find out the fire gear that we were all wearing for the last 20 years or whatever actually was producing the toxins that was giving everybody Oops. cancer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, everything, a lot of stuff, like I said, happens and to the normal person or, you know, somebody outside of the fire service would be like, wow, that's crazy. And it's just like, yeah, it was, it was just one of the runs during that, that particular shift. But yeah, it's, it's different. And every day is kind of different. You always, you know, you never know what you're going to show up on. I mean, you get woken up at three o'clock in the morning and it's like, you know, report of a house full of gas and you get there, open up the door of the truck and it smells like a skunk was right there on the curb. And it's like, you walk up to the door and you go, Hey, can you come outside real quick? Smell like is this, this the smell you smell? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, okay, that's a skunk. That's not natural gas. <laughs> At least those you get to go back and get well, bad. Well, that brings me to a question, though. What is the normal schedule for somebody who is a firefighter? So, I mean, it varies coast to coast, but pretty much kind of in the Midwest, we do 2448s. So we have a three platoon system. And so you'll work 24 hours straight. So you go in at like 7 or 8 a.m. and work till 7 or 8 a.m. the next day. And then you're off for two days. Which to a lot of people, they're like, wow, that's got to be weird to, but after doing it for 31 years, I couldn't imagine doing another schedule because, and it's pretty nice, you know, when, I mean, cause you can take one day off and have five days off. And, and it's the weirdest thing to me is like, if I asked you to, what's the busiest night, what nights do you think we don't sleep at the firehouse? I'm guessing weekends, right? Sunday and Monday. Don't ask really? me why. They're People like, get too loose, maybe. I, don't, I think, uh, well, we have a ton of EMS calls on Sunday night because everybody waited all weekend going, oh, I hope this chest pain goes away. And then it's like, oh, I'm supposed to work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can imagine that now that you mention it. Yeah, I've had many of those nights. But yeah, it's crazy. It's like Sundays and Mondays. It's thinking like, about going back to work. That's what it is. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, that's a, a big part of it, too, but. Yeah, it's crazy. You would think that, you know, and not that Friday and Saturday nights aren't busy, but yeah, it's, it's, it amazes me sometimes because it's like, and if you get like a full moon in a Sunday night, that's, oh. Yeah, I've heard that there are a lot of full moon stories there. So, like on an average, I don't know, month, do you have days where it's just, I don't know if this is better or worse. You're just waiting for a call, then it never happens. I mean, I couldn't tell you the last time we had like a day where there, there was no calls, but we average, we do eight to 9,000 calls a year. So it ends up being, I mean, for the, you know, for three stations or whatever, I think we average like 20 to 30 a day. So it's, I mean, and that may be, you know, one of the stations maybe might take 10 of those um, and be a little bit busier or whatever, but yeah, it's, it stays pretty busy and we run, they, there's kind of a whole process called mutual aid. And so we run with adjoining departments on, on calls also. So we might go into, you know, the, the adjoining city to help them out on a call because all their trucks are tied up on stuff. And, and, and that end of the, the city that we're close to is really, really busy nowadays. I mean, and, and that's the area where I grew up. So it's funny just to see that, you know, it used to be they had one engine and one medic and, this particular station and that medic was the busiest medic in the city. So they added a second medic there. Now that second medic is the second busiest medic in the city because yeah, I guess it took, was needed. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's crazy. The amount of uh, emergency medical calls that they're taking and, and then we get the overflow for those or whatever too. But so like in any job, right, you have a bunch of different people, a bunch of different personalities. I got to think everybody kind of in your line of work maybe has the, kind of a baseline, similar type of personality because it takes that special kind of person. But within that, there must be that one guy that's just like super crazy, like wants to just do outrageous things, you know. Yeah, I think we're talking to him. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Maybe back in the day I was that guy. I think I've slowed down a little bit. But yeah, you always have kind of that, um, that guy or, and even now, you know, or that girl because we have some pretty outstanding female firefighters and stuff too. But yeah, it's, 
you know, and, and I think it, it kind of draws people to it. It seems like the people that were are more like that have, were like either in the Marines or, you know, have some kind of military background. Or, or they too, became so. cops. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now I'll tell you, I don't think everybody knows this, but I've known Jeff the majority of my life. I believe somehow or other our mothers made some kind of connection in the year before kindergarten, they set up a play date so we've known each other since we were probably five or six years old. Mm -hmm. That said, just like any kind of relationship, you know, once you go through high school and, you know, everyone kind of goes on their own path, I really haven't talked to Jeff. Gosh, it's probably in 30 years. We probably talked two or three times. Right. I mean, it's not like we're, we're, we're that close from that perspective. We just have that lifelong friendship. But Jeff, do you remember trying to recruit me at a fire scene? I don't remember this. So let me tell the story. I have to preface it with another story since you talked about toxins. I just mentioned this story to Chris um, last week, and he was honestly a little upset with me because he had never heard this story before. But back when I was in third or fourth grade, there was a girl that I really, really liked. You know, she was just really pretty and I remember that her family just seemed a little wild. She lived near near these apartment complexes that were down the street from our grade school. And one day I went to her house and she was at her, her cousin babysitting us. Well, her cousin was all the wisdom of her eighth grade education uh, could give her. We decide, me, her, her cousin, and her little sister, that we're going to go to these apartments and we're going to break into one of the apartments. Again, the oldest person in this group is in eighth grade, and we're in like third and fourth grade. And the sister, I think, was younger than that. So we go to these apartments, and they were furnished apartments, and we were going down on the ground and looking underneath the door to see if anybody was walking around, and we could just pick the locks. You know, this was early on. There was no real heavy security. So we get in there, and being in third or fourth grade, the most important thing for us to do, we're just jumping on the beds. We're stupid. We're idiots. So we're jumping around on the beds. And all of a sudden, her, co her cousin, who's the babysitter, comes running in and says, we got a problem. We're like, what's the matter? I caught the couch on fire. Well, her cousin, who in my recollection looked a lot like Tom Petty, she ends <laughs> up smoking in eighth grade and she drops the cigarette on the couch, which then caught these beads that were used uh, for like drapes and those things were petroleum based. And I just remember running out there and looking at this fire starting and I'm telling you what, stop, drop and roll and all that shit you learn early on. It's real because that fire took off that petroleum based bead was dropping on that carpet. That carpet started going up and we just took off. I tell you this story because not only did we burn down this apartment complex, but <laughs> I will never forget that smell of the materials of carpet and couches and drapes. I'll never forget that because it was one of the scariest moments of my life. So fast forward, I'm married. My wife and I live in this apartment complex in the suburb of where we grew up. And I'm driving down the street and I have the windows down and I smell that exact same smell. I looked at Kim, my wife, and I said, something's on fire around here. And she's like, okay, whatever. And I said, no, I've smelled this before. Like something is on fire. And we drive up a little bit further. And sure enough, we're driving by these apartments and there's this black, heavy smoke going up. So we drive in there and we are the second people there. Somebody was grilling next to, they had these apartments and they had a, a garage that had a little breezeway between it. And they had their grill between the breezeway just caught fire up the siding and it had started to engulf the entire part of the apartments. So there was one person there and I said, Hey, um, let's start knocking on doors and get people out of here in case this thing starts going. So we're knocking on doors and then I start to hear the fire trucks coming. So I'm like, Oh good. Cause I don't want to be pulling people out of here. So we end up uh, knocking on all these doors. The first fire trucks comes up and there's Jeff in the fire truck. And I said, Hey man, what's going on? And, you said, hey, hey, what's up? And you went to the back of the truck. And by this time, this fire's taking off. 
and you pulled out some chainsaws and you set them on the ground. And then you got another set of chainsaws and you said, hey, grab those and follow me. <laughs> so stupid me, he's in fire gear. I just grabbed these things and I'm following them. And I'm thinking, what, what's he got planned here? And he walks right inside the house that's on fire. And I remember going, hey, hey, I was yelling at you. And you were just headed upstairs. And I just set those things down <laughs> right at the front door and saw one of the other guys and said, yeah, you might want to take those to him. I think he wants those. <laughs> I'm not going in a burning house. I don't was, know what the hell I'm doing. It was seed or something. It was. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but I just remember like, just follow me. <clears throat> okay, I'll follow you up in the burning house. I don't think so. But I'll never forget that smell. I sniffed that thing out um, down the street and I thought, oh gosh. And of course, Kim thought I was crazy, but now... She knows I'm crazy when I had to tell her why I knew that smell. <laughs> well, I remember when I was getting on the fire department, I was trying to get Chris to do it or whatever too. And he was kind of putting in things when um, applications and stuff when we were, you know, that was early on way back in early nineties or whatever. But Right. I was kind of still searching, right. For, for what I wanted to do. And that job sounded pretty cool. And actually that kind of leads me to my, my one EMS story as, as well. You know, Scott had some good ones there, but, um, you know, I took it uh, kind of a step further, right? Instead of doing fire school first, I thought, well, I'll just become an EMT. That'll be my key to getting on at a fire station. So during, um, you know, the local community college, I'm taking this, this course. So part of the um, protocol through this course is we would do um, rotations at various hospitals in the ER. So I remember um, being in the ER one time, and it, this was after the people were already there. Then you kind of had to go over after the fact you know, take their vitals, ask them the story, then see if you kind of came up with the same, you know, reasons why they were there. It was kind of a learning tool. So I go up to this guy and, hi, my name's Chris. I'm from Columbus State Community College. I'm an EMS student. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. He goes, yeah, sure, no problem. I said, so first of all, you know, my first question, I got my little notepad and we wore these white little doctor jackets. I said, well, my first question today is, you know, what brought you in today? He goes, oh, well, the ambulance. I was like, oh, well, okay, I kind of, I kind of figured that one out, um, but I noticed he had a huge gash on his head. I said, "No, I mean, like, what's the reason you're in here today?" He goes, "Oh man, I got in a fight with my wife, with my girlfriend, and she hit me with the smooth." I'm like, "Okay," and I'm writing this down, and I'm like, "I'm sorry, you got in a fight with your girlfriend, and um, she hit you with something." I didn't quite catch it. I'm sorry. The smooth. Uh, I'm writing it down. I'm trying to be real calm and collected, like I know what he's talking about. I'm like, "I'm sorry, sorry. I'm just not catching that last word." He goes, man, come on, man. She hit me with the smooth. You know that thing you smooth your clothes out with? <laughs> <laughs> so I take his vitals and do whatever. And I go back and I'm just cracking up telling the proctor dude or whatever. I'm like, yeah, he said he hit him with the smooth. And of course, he's like, the what? And so finally, you know. Um, and so a few things with that. Um, not too long after that, I kind of realized maybe firefighting wasn't going to be my job. So I joined the Army Reserve. And when you're in the Army, you have to iron your stuff constantly. So I buy this iron and right on the side of it, I wrote, cause you had to label everything or people would steal your shit. So I wrote right on it, the smooth. So everybody <laughs> knew that that was my iron. And then you fast forward 25 years later, there's a pretty popular movie out there called Patriot Day, kind of about the Boston Marathon bombing. And at the very beginning of that movie, Mark Wahlberg's in the middle of telling this story, or no, they captured this guy, or they run this guy down. And he basically tells the same story that he got yeah. in a fight because you know, his wife hit him with the smooth. So somehow I'm connected to Hollywood. Yeah, I don't I, know how that works. I but. will tell you, uh, I have known Chris since we were 16 years old. I heard this story probably two weeks after it happened. He is patient zero on it. Uh, and I don't think you're getting any of the back end on that movie. I know. Mark Wahlberg, if you're listening, <laughs> I need some royalties here. <laughs> well, and the other part that's funny about that story, you know, we all grew up and our wives were friends and we used to play Pictionary. Well, there was a time when, you know, when you pull out that card and it came up as smooth. I mean, think how hard smooth is in Pictionary. Not in this household. No, it was very quick. So, yeah, you, you, you made a Pictionary game a lot easier. Thank you. So, Jeff, I know that you do a little bit of both firefighting then and EMS. And I think for the most part, people that are kind of there at the firehouse, they maybe have a special job or, you know, they're either on the engine or they're on the medic or whatever. But what is kind of the most common call, I guess. I mean, obviously the engine, it's going to be house fires. And I do know that they assist on medical emergencies and, and car accidents, but for the most part, 
what, what's probably the, the, the number one call that an EMS would go out on? Um, well, the area that we cover is, um, refer to it as heaven's waiting room because we have an abundant amount of nursing homes in the area or assisted living and, and probably almost three times what neighboring places have. They kind of, I think that the, the city actually said we're not doing any more of these because there are so many of them. So we do get a lot of like that geriatric elderly, you know, hip fractures, stuff like that. But it's, again, it's the, the beauty of it is, is like, you just never know, you know, from day to day, it's like, you might go to one of those places and all of a sudden it's like, oh, this guy shot himself, you know, like putting his gun on. And it's like, <laughs> I was not expecting, you know, this when we showed up here. <laughs> So, so you get the run to the geriatric home, and in your mind, you're preparing for, okay, probably some chest pain, maybe a diabetic <laughs> right. issue, and then you get there, and he shot yeah. a hole in his leg. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or you get a heroin overdose or something oh, in one wow. of those, and you're like, and because there's a few of them where they kind of, it's not necessarily just like 55 and over or older, you know, they let some other people in there. And we do have one that's huge. I mean, I think total between independent living and like full nursing care. And then they have uh, assisted living. Everyone in there is deaf. So it's like you have that whole trying to communicate with them. And so I know a lot of the guys at that particular station that's first in, in that area, no sign language and everything, but it's rough, you know, it's like, yeah, you're I imagine to, it is. And, and it's kind of like, you know, a lot of people don't even know it exists, but it's like, you know, so the whole fire alarm system is different there and everything for, you know, for deaf people or whatever. So there's just like tons of strobe lights everywhere. Right. And you're just like, oh my gosh. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in, in any given day, it's, I mean, just the other day we had a guy 9 a.m. in the morning, just outside the local hospital by the parking garage, overdosed on heroin, gave him Narcan, took him over to the ER, come, I don't know, 12, it was, it was lunchtime. Same spot, same guy, overdosed on heroin again. And it's like, dude, I don't know what it is you're using, but stop. 4 p.m. He had gotten, made his way all the way to the local pharmacy that's on the corner of the CVS pharmacy. Same thing. And wow. It's just like, I'm like, dude, three times, man. I go, there's no guarantees after this. I go, we should have a three Narcan limit, but I don't, I don't yeah, think that's Yeah, poor on. soul, man. People... You talk about things addictive. Did you take him to the hospital each time? Yeah. So he was already out and back in yeah. in 24 hours, three yeah. times. Yeah. It's and these impressive. guys know to sign themselves out. You know, right. they'll, yeah, they'll yeah. stay as long as they absolutely have to and, and get out. And I mean, some of them, it's like you'll talk to them and man, they just have terrible backstories. Of course. You know, it's like they didn't stand a chance, but. Yeah. Those drugs know. are a really fun, uh, you know, escape from life for a while, but you recognize after a while, these guys aren't doing this stuff for fun. Yeah. They're doing it because they want to feel even the least bit normal. And that's just a horrible way to live. I feel for those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a lot, I mean, and you, and we'll kind of get those trends of that, that kind of come through. And so you might have two or three shifts or where you have four or five overdoses. Cause it's like, Oh, you guys must all be getting for this from the same person. And it's a bad batch. So, you know, yeah, it's like, right. That somebody laced that with some fentanyl or something in there. And, but yeah, to do it three times in a day, I'm like, dude, just go get whatever you got to get somewhere else and throw that stuff away. Cause this is not working. <laughs> I go one of these times, somebody's not going to see you and we're right. not going to get to you in time. Yeah. That's, it's pretty rampant right now. So that's not, uh, too uncommon that a lot of people don't get caught yeah. until after it's too late. Yeah. I had a really cool thing where the UPS guy in my neighborhood, and this has been a number of years ago or whatever, he pulls up and was bringing a package and he's like, he looks at me and he goes, you don't remember me, do you? And I'm like, uh, I don't, I go, did, did I know you from somewhere? And he's like, I was homeless. And he goes, I was living, there used to be a, a restaurant, um, I think it was actually like a catering thing or whatever. It was a Schmitz and he was living kind of behind there. The place had shut down and we actually ran on him at a fast food restaurant out in front of there earlier and he didn't want to go to the hospital or anything. And so we kind of gave him a ride back. He said he was staying behind that place. So we ran back over to the hospital and got a bunch of blankets out of the heater there or whatever and took them back over because it was pretty cold 
And me and the other guy I was working with, we gave him like 50 bucks. We're like, here, man, you know, get some food and stuff or whatever. And he's like, he goes, you know, it took me about a year and a half or two years to get out of that. And he's like, and I've been working for UPS for like five years now. And I got That's a family awesome. and um, it was cool. And I, I just totally shocked me that he recognized me because I, you know, I didn't. He looked totally different than he did then, obviously. Yeah. But it was right, cool right. that, you know, it's like, man. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for sharing some stories with us today. It looks like that about wraps it up here. But before we finish, Chris, what have we learned today? Yeah, I learned don't smoke in the eighth grade and drop your cigarette on a couch. I can uh, attest that is not a good thing to do. Jeff? Um I learned that it's still a great career. So if you're ever interested in being a firefighter, go do it. It's uh, it's we're we're always looking for people. That's for sure. Well, then this ought to help with that because I learned that firefighter school, like many other jobs, teaches you just enough not to get killed. So uh, you know, put that on your on your recruitment material. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode for Chris Kiernan and Jeff. This is Scott McLaughlin saying we'll see you at work. Thank you for listening to the Not in the Job Description podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, or if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please let us know by sending us an email to brief description of your story to stories at notinthejob.com.